And this is Morris, and he's going to talk to you about VMware code and then we'll have from Trevor Roberts about uh, Windows on the Hey guys, I'm just here to uh, allow Trevor to get actually a drink. Um, so I run VMware Code with VMware. We are a developer community trying to focus on enterprise developers. Um, we are really trying to build a community around three things. Uh, it's a community, like getting you guys involved, access, access to uh, VMware technology and discussion groups and uh, knowledge and forums, uh, and then experience, right? Um, that is really about um, getting you know, events like this organized and providing uh, infrastructure and an ecosystem for you guys to get to know each other and uh, have relevant conversations. Um, if you guys can help me out and go to VMware code and register for it, that would be awesome because that's how I get judged on <laughs> my little marketing programs. Uh, if not, that's good enough. That is fine. Uh, I hope you guys can have a good time. And, uh, thank you for. Joining that I've never is that, so I did my job. <laughs> All right. Before you get started, yeah. who did the map? The map was fantastic because I think in November, December, we're talking about the other yes. side of the campus. It's got to be a good place. Yes, we learned from that. So we have a map that's very nice. But we did this with the design, we did the signs up. We used to get signs up. Yeah, right. All right. right. It was great. But next time it's going to be straight signs. Yeah. Promise. Thank you, guys. Oh, I have stickers, which I will distribute. And they're free. And they're free. I have <coughs> stickers. All right. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. And I know we staggered up at 7 p.m. That's a lot of dedication. And I see some folks that have the actual OpenStack Summer Church in Boston. A couple here. Uh, mine didn't fit me because they ran out of my size. But that's why I kept it showing up. My name is Trevor Roberts, and I work at VMware. I'm a typical marketing manager for OpenStack, and my job is to get out in front of partners, customers, the general community, and talk about what VMware is doing with OpenStack. So before I get into the main topic of the evening, I just want to share with you guys what exactly VMware is doing with OpenStack, because sometimes when I talk to people, they're a little skeptical. Like, isn't OpenStack supposed to be communicating or competing with VMware? Well, that's not necessarily the case. <laughs> So if you have not heard about VMware, we're the small little company that uh, is working in virtualization and cloud technologies, and we want to help our customers, help the community in general, be successful with their private cloud deployments. And this includes OpenStack. We have our own distribution called VMware Integrated OpenStack, and it's open source OpenStack. We're not changing any of the code. The only thing we do is activate the VMware drivers by default. And we are hiring, so if any of you are interested in network virtualization with the VMware NSX team, they work very closely with OpenStack technologies, uh, check out this link. And I'll pause for all the cameras to finish taking their pictures. You just laid off 600 people. Um, that's a good point to bring up, but they're not from this department. Okay, I'll go ahead and move forward. Okay, so what is VMware doing with the OpenStack community? We're not just here to take from the community, we also give back. So we have about 23 developers, 181 commits in the top of the lease, uh, 14,000 lines of code, and about 1,500 patches of VMware. So that has us as being one of the top 10 contributors, and we're hoping to continue that momentum with each release. And just to show you a little timeline of our contribution starting in 2010, we had the Open V Switch project started by a company called Nicera, which VMware eventually acquired. And from then on, we kept on going on with our OpenStack contributions. So in 2013, we have drivers for uh, vSphere, Cinder, and Neutron. <clears throat> and then also with last year, we had the first release and second release of VMware integrated OpenStack. 2016, we're looking to continue with that momentum. Okay, so how many folks here went to the OpenStack Summit? All right, a good number of people. So, um, how many of you actually watched the keynotes if you weren't there? Okay, all right. 
Well, uh, one of the main messages from Don and Bryce and Mark Collier that I really appreciated was that OpenStack wants to work with other open source projects. It's not just about the OpenStack community, but working with any open source project that will help developers be successful on the OpenStack cloud. So he had described something along the lines of infrastructure primitives, and that's where you have your IaaS layer. On top of that, you have your application primitives, so things such as database as a service, DNS as a service, those value-added projects that help you get more out of your IaaS platform. And then also cloud-native frameworks, so your Kubernetes, your Mesosphere, your Google Cloud Foundry, and also Red Hat Ocean. So the, the main theme was OpenStack can't just exist by itself. That's not going to give developers the value. We need to incorporate other or work with other open source products to be successful. And then Mark Collier had a little bit of a more dire warning, either collaborate or die. So I thought that was uh, pretty to the point. That brings up, uh, you know, make sure that we're working with other open source communities. Okay, so we're just going to dive right into working with OpenStack and Windows together. I know that might seem like a bit of a, a misnomer or something, because isn't OpenStack only about Linux? That's not necessarily the case. Your customers, your users, they want to be able to run Windows smartphones on your OpenStack cloud. Are any of you experimenting with Windows images? OK. Um, how many of you are interested in Windows? All right. How many of you are here for the free food? I should see all my hands going up. That's pretty good. All right. I, I know I might have my dinner. So if you have any of the free food, please go ahead. Take it from the back. We don't want to take anything back home with us. So feel free to get up while I'm talking and go back. <clears throat> so what are we going to talk about today? First of all, you can actually use the OpenStack CLI on Windows, and I'll show you an example of that working. So just because uh, it's Windows doesn't mean that you can't install Python and one pip install Python on the clients and all that. And then we'll also talk about how do we qualify our environments for working with Windows images, because you can't just um, choose any platform and run Windows on top of it. You have to be within Microsoft's uh, recommended standing, as well as recommended configurations from your hypervisor vendor. And then we'll actually show how you build your image and deploying instances. And how many of you have heard of CloudBase? OK, I should see everyone's hand going up. OK, if you're interested in Windows on OpenStack, CloudBase for Windows is the same thing as Cloud Init for Linux. And um, it's a company called CloudBase. I think they're based somewhere in Europe. Uh, but they do a pretty good job of allowing you to put uh, automation scripts into your instances as you're deploying them, just as you would do with CloudBase. OK, so let's take a look at using the OpenStack CLI on Windows. OK, so the way it works is, first of all, install the latest version of Python 2 on your Windows desktop. And with this, pip is installed automatically. You don't have to do uh, apt get install Python 2 and then apt get install Python pip. Uh, from there, you load your variables into the uh, environments or into your memory, just as you normally would with Linux. So I'm using PowerShell. How many of you are using PowerShell versus Batch Scripts? OK. So if you're using Batch Scripts, you can do something similar. But I highly recommend learning PowerShell because that's the way of the future for Windows. So I see here my environment variables, uh, setting my auth authentication URL, username, and so forth. And then I can actually do multi-line commands. So with PowerShell, it's a backtick. That's not an apostrophe. So make sure you do a backtick. So I'll go ahead and my actual desktop. So here's my PowerShell window, just regular Windows. I'm not doing anything crazy. If I do a Nova list. Uh, 
I'll see a list out of all my instances, just like I normally would on Linux. I can do the same thing with my images. Again, no special magic or anything like that. It works just like you normally would expect it to on Linux. So I'll just go ahead and show you um, my environment variables. All right, so if I go through my environment variables, you can see that they're listed here. I can either set them manually like this. Um, for Windows administrators, this is a, a familiar interface. Just go into your environment variables properties window. Or I can actually go into PowerShell and set it that way with an automated script. So very simple, just $env colon the environment variable that you want to set and the Nova clients, Glance clients, all of the OpenStack CLIs, they pull their environment variables just like they would from Linux. OK, so what I'm going to do is I actually have an image that I want to import. And here is my sample syntax. I'll pause for the people taking pictures. And let's go back to the PowerShell window. I promise I'll pause so you can take another picture. All right, it's a little cut off, but you get the idea. By using these back ticks, I'm able to do uh, multi-line commands, just like I normally do with uh, Linux with that backslash. All right, and in a few seconds, I should see my progress bar start with my image import. I don't know if it's going to finish by the end of my presentation, but at least um, we're actually seeing it in action. OK, but how do we actually build these images? How do we uh, design our environment so that we're in compliance with Microsoft regulations, as well as the regulations of our hypervisor vendors? OK, how many of you are using Ubuntu? as your um, hypervisor OS, like your hypervisor OS, using Ubuntu. All right, how many folks are using Red Hat? OK, there's one, uh, a couple. Um, and I spoke to someone uh, from SAP that's using SUSE. Uh, there you are, OK. So each of your uh, vendors will have uh, standards on what kernel of the Linux operating system which version of their operating system, as well as the drivers that you need to run. What you need to do is actually consult with them so that you're in compliance, because I suppose all of us have support contracts, right? Unless we want to be writing the code that's going to fix our users' problems. I don't know how hardcore some of you guys are, but I am not. So I like to have my vendors actually work for me. Once you have that in place, go ahead and check which Windows or which Microsoft application you want to run in your OpenStack cloud. Some folks are content with SQL Server. Some others want to run Exchange, Active Directory, and so on. And Microsoft actually has a pretty thorough listing of all of their applications that are compatible to run on virtualization platforms. And the way it works is that your vendor will either certify their OpenStack distribution or their hypervisor against Microsoft's uh, server virtualization program, validation program. And as long as you see the application that you're looking for in that list, as well as your vendor and version in that list, then you're good to go. Uh, you're within um, Microsoft's standards for what they'll like accept as a, a support case. Most likely, you're going to have to open that case with your vendor. So for example, if you have an issue with running Exchange Server on OpenStack on VMware, um, you'll have to call VMware first, and then VMware will liaise with Microsoft on your behalf, and then uh, you'll figure out the trouble to get that done. And the same thing would happen with any vendor that's on this list. OK, and um, I can show the site real quick. Let's see.
So here's the server catalog, and I can actually look at a per open, sorry, per operating system uh, basis. So if I go and click further down, well, I don't want it to be a VMware commercial. Let me go back. So I can see here the versions of SUSE Linux Enterprise Server uh, that will be compatible with Windows Server 2012 R2, for example. And that way I know that my cloud, if I'm using that version of SUSE, that I'm able to be in Microsoft's support standard. Same thing for Windows. Any questions on that site? I didn't have the URL, URL there because it's fairly long and cumbersome. Just search for this term, Microsoft Server Virtualization Validation Program, and you'll get all the information. I wish somebody had told me about this when I first started. It took me a long time before I was not getting shut down by Microsoft support. OK, so the next thing is to build your image. Um, have any of you tried building a Windows image on KVM before? OK. Um, well, it's not a trivial task. It's not super hard, but it's not trivial. So you'll want to be aware of what are the best practices for deploying uh, Windows on your chosen hypervisor. Some are easier than others. For example, I'm sure it's pretty easy on Hyper-V to deploy Windows because, hey, that's Microsoft's hypervisor. So first of all, verify the correct drivers for storage and networking. How many of you have heard of Vert.io? Okay, so Vert.io are a bunch of open source drivers for storage and networking that you would use for running Windows on top of AVM. So as you're building your image, you would mount your ISO when you launch the virtual machine, and you also mount the ISO for uh, the Vert IO drivers. And that way you can load them up as you're installing Windows. Um, yeah, go ahead. I was wondering, the uh, understanding that all your virtual IO drivers for Windows had to come from Windows. They had to be signed. And they were open source, not available for open source. That's just my idea of Right. So the question was, uh, the gentleman now was um, under the impression that any drivers that you use with your Windows image on top of KVM, for example, need to be uh, signed or at least part uh, developed by Microsoft. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So that is um, partially the case. They should be signed, um, and they should be. Uh, Microsoft should be aware of it. Um, definitely, your operating system vendor has to be on that list that I just showed. But the drivers actually come from your vendor itself. So um, there's some open source Vert IO drivers that you can download from anywhere. They're not necessarily going to be compatible with your OpenStack vendor or with your operating system vendor. So not all Vert IO drivers are created equal. And I learned this the hard way uh, right before I went into production, uh, running Windows on KVM with Ubuntu. Uh, Canonical actually has their own compiled for IO drivers that have to go with a specific kernel of Linux in their operating system. And fortunately for me, at the time I was working with another uh, service <coughs> provider, at the time we just happened to upgrade our Ubuntu servers to that kernel level. So it was kind of a stroke of luck because uh, we had I don't know, about 150 servers that we had just finished upgrading. Uh, definitely wouldn't want to go through that again just to provide Windows support. So I highly recommend, before you get started with your Windows images, you talk to your operating system vendor to find out which Vert IO drivers uh, they're supporting on which operating systems and which kernel versions are required. That's important because even if you have a support contract with them, if you don't have the right kernel, they're not going to support you. And I've actually seen Windows on the screen when you're not on the right kernel version. So it's very important to have that nailed down. Okay, so the next thing to do is create a virtual machine using your platform hypervisor. Uh, you can technically create a virtual machine in VirtualBox and then port it over. But I, um, 
a little superstitious about that. You know, that's a crazy thing for technology guy to say he's superstitious about his hypervisor. But I highly recommend that if you're running your instances on KVM on Ubuntu, that that's the environment that you build your, your images on. And you just use the, the Kimo, uh, Kimo. Let me see if I have the syntax here. I actually be on the bottom. Let me see if I can stretch it out. I can't. I'll actually put it on the slide and make it a little busy, but. I just want you to see the simple, the sample syntax. Okay, so this uh, wonderful syntax is the line that I use to kick off my Windows images on AVI. Looks really simple, right guys? <laughs> uh, after a few times, it becomes second nature, actually. And um, well, I don't have it memorized, I got it. I've been talking over notes because I don't want to forget it. But pretty much, I'm um, using the Kimo system command uh, on my Ubuntu server. I enable KVM since that is going to be my hypervisor of choice in my OpenStack cloud. And I load my Windows ISO as a CD-ROM. And then I also have another drive file for my hard drive. I'm calling it Windows 2012 R2 image. That's going to be the disk or QCAL2 file that I'm going to import into my OpenStack cloud. Then I have another drive option for my canonical drivers. As I said before, the Burt IO drivers will work okay, but they can cause blue screens, uh, the open source ones that are out there in the wild. So make sure that you get the supported Burt IO drivers from your vendor, and make sure you load it when you're installing one of those. And then the rest are, well, you want to make sure that you have optional things like the Burt IO driver, um, it's for memory management, but it's something good to keep in mind, as well as uh, setting my Vert IO driver for my network card. And then uh, at the end, I set my VNC setting so I can open up no VNC and get into my, uh, my video <coughs> image and start doing the install. Any questions on this? Sorry. So are the Vert IO drivers part of my operating system image? Is that the question? Um, I seem to recall that when I was doing this back in the day, that Windows has some older Vert IO drivers, but they're not current, and they're most likely not supported by your vendor on the latest operating system that you're working with. So since you're working with Windows on top of Linux, I know some of us like to live dangerously and not have support contracts. But this is definitely one area that I highly recommend having a support contract. I know it's not fun, and I know it's expensive, but support contracts will really help you when um, you have to support your users. You don't want to have just any random drivers or older drivers that will cause a blue screen at the wrong time, right? So even though Windows has some older for drivers, provider drivers, I highly recommend using the one from your operating system vendor. Okay, any other questions? All right, let's see. All right, so I deploy Windows and configure the VM for use with OpenStack. So some of the things that I do, how many of you actually use the Windows Firewall? Oh, you do? Okay. Well, um, I do not. <laughs> but uh, you can either... <laughs> But you don't use you don't use Microsoft's own firewall, right? You use the McAfee firewall, right? Okay, so not if you use a firewall on Windows. Do you use the actual Microsoft Windows firewall? Do you? Okay, cool. Well, in that case, open up the ports that you need. So, for example, uh, remote desktop protocol runs on three three eight nine TCP. So make sure you open that up in the firewall. Okay, do things like that so that your remote access uh, works. If you're going to be uh, running a web server, for some reason you want to punish yourself and run my IS, <laughs> go ahead and open up port 80 and 443. 
So yeah, and, it, and also enable remote desktop protocol uh, because by default it's uh, disabled. That's an important thing. Otherwise, you're not going to get it to your console. And last but not least, run your platform updates. Yes. Um, you have to put your image. I have my notes here at the moment. That is only a, a, a container for the installer's station. Is that true? Or? Right. So when I'm talking about building my image, first I'm creating a virtual machine that forms the basis for my image. And right now we're in the middle of configuring that virtual machine to be of use on open site. So I'm configuring my firewall, configuring my ports, um, configuring the services that I need to run like a one desktop protocol. So we're not at the point where we're going to import the image to landscape. We're just creating our blank virtual machine to import into open site. Okay, any other questions? All right, we'll just keep plugging along here. And last but not least, this is not a requirement, which is cloud-based in it. Um, but if you are running an OpenStack cloud, I highly recommend to install cloud-based. It is a great utility. It's an open source project. Uh, the folks at cloud-based, um, including Alessandro Body, they are doing a tremendous job of supporting the community to allow them to run Windows on OpenStack without issues. And if you haven't used cloud-based yet before, uh, we'll see some examples. Just like with uh, cloud init, you can use batch scripts to customize your instance. You can use, uh, you can use PowerShell scripts, actually, to make configuration uh, changes on your Windows instance. OK, and this is cut off a little bit because of the syntax I have on the screen. But your Windows deployment um, can actually be automated using a tool like Hacker. How many folks have heard of HashiCorp? You've heard of Vagrant too, right? Well, they have this tool called Packer, and that allows you to automate the deployments of an operating system, and then you can run like your puppet manifest, your Ansible playbooks against it to configure it even further. You have a question? Yeah, um, I know that uh, Pablo Mason works with KVM, but it also works with VMware. Cloud Mason then works with OpenStack, actually or any uh, metadata service, uh, yeah, that runs on 169254 or 169.254. So as long as that URL is available to your instance and whatever platform that you're running, obviously it is compatible. Yeah. Um, other questions? Chef? Yeah, so I didn't mention Chef specifically, but Chef, Salt, um, all of that can work with Packer to do your automated division. You can even use shell scripts. Give you that crazy. I know some of you are hardcore in here, but that's something you can help use my answer with those. Okay, any questions on building your image? This is a pretty important step. You don't want to skip this. You don't want to make any shortcuts. Otherwise, your users end up with blue screens, and then you get those calls at 3 o'clock in the morning as to why is your cloud so grabbing? All right, we're all running like airtight clouds. We're following the best practices for building our image. So what comes next? OK, so these are some examples of code to uh, actually customize your instance as you're launching. And cloud-based init has a keyword, just like you have cloud config when you're doing your cloud init scripts. Uh, it's either PS1 SysNative or PS1 x86. And what's the difference? Well, if you're not familiar with Windows, it has even the 64-bit uh, versions of the operating system actually have 32-bit uh, binaries that come with the uh, operating system. So if for some reason you're running Windows 2012 R2 and you want to run the 32-bit versions of the binaries for your commands, you would specify PS1 x86. Otherwise, specify SysNative, and that will give you the 64-bit versions of the binaries. So any, pretty much any PowerShell command that you can run in a regular PowerShell script can be run with cloud-based init. So first of all, you start with that directive saying that this is a PowerShell script. Then I want to change my uh, user's password, the administrator user. So I go ahead and run that command. 
just like I normally would in a PowerShell server. This is this syntax I can actually copy put into a PowerShell file, and I can run it on my Windows server, no problem. And uh, let's see, I create a new directory and has a path called C data scripts VM code. So that's not as exciting as we would like. So we'll take a look at installing features, installing programs that are native to Microsoft Windows in uh, some of the demo examples that I have. Okay, any questions on uh, the directives or any of the syntax? This is straight uh, PowerShell syntax. Nothing special is done here. So if you find any samples out there, odds are you can actually run it with cloud based units on your instance. And here's the setup of the cloud based uh, binaries on the file system of your operating system. Actually, what you're doing is at the end of your image build process, right before you shut it down, the last step, as I showed before, was install cloud base. It has a fairly small footprint, 92 megabytes, and it gives you a lot of benefits, such as being able to use your uh, URL for getting the metadata in your instance. Also, it will automatically resize the new partition according to your flavor. So, of course, you can't use a smaller flavor than what the operating system was designed for. So, if your C drive is, it has 15 gigabytes of storage, make sure that you don't use the tiny flavor with it because it will not boot. Okay? Um, but if you're going to go larger, for example, if you want to uh, install a database server or some other application server, some kind of an SAP ERP system or something, then you might choose a larger flavor. So by default, um, Microsoft recommends 32 gigs for the Windows 2012 R2. Uh, so I actually start with the uh, medium flavor and then go up. And then here you see the various um, directories that are in program files for cloud-based solutions. Uh, bin, straightforward, all the binaries. Uh, the one that you're really interested in here is logs. So if there's anything that happens with your customization that doesn't work, you can actually look at the log directory after the boot finishes and see if there are any errors there for you to examine. Okay, so what I'm going to do is actually kick off a couple of instances and then we'll see the customizations as they happen. Okay, so here's my environment. I'm just gonna actually go ahead and launch an instance. And I'll just call it WinTest01. For this one, I'm actually going to uh, deploy the Active Directory domain services. I'm not gonna configure it completely, but as you can see here, when I choose my image, I made sure to select uh, a minimum disk size so it automatically changes the flavor, which is something that will support my operating system. Um, for my security groups, I just accept the defaults. I opened up uh, port 80, 443, already in my security groups. And post-creation is the area where I'll actually put my cloud-based scripts. All right, so actually I'll start the web server one. So this example is actually going to change my password for my administrator user, and then it's also going to install IIS. And that's what you're seeing here. So first of all, I'm changing my password, then I go import modules, server manager. If you're gonna be installing any features using PowerShell, you need to import that module. Then I'm gonna add the Windows feature web server. Very complicated, right? No, not at all. And then the last thing I do is I'm gonna create my index.html file in the root of the web server. And uh, this is the value that we see here, a very simple web page. I'm not a web developer, so we're not gonna see any crazy graphics. I apologize in advance. All right, so let's go back and we'll put these instructions in, and we'll go ahead and launch. So that'll take a little bit of time to build. So I'll go ahead and launch my second example. And this is the one where we'll actually uh, enable 
uh, domain services for configuration. So I'll get my other cloud-based set of instructions where I'm installing the Windows feature AD Domain Services. And this will enable the feature so that I can go back and do my configuration of my domain controller when I would like to later. I'll go ahead and assign a floating IP to my first Windows image, for instance. Okay, and while those are actually building, it'll take a few minutes just because um, I have this very blazingly fast NFS backend on my OpenStack Cloud. So it does take a few minutes to boot up. But let me just show you that image that we launched before is uh, here, that Windows 2008 image that I loaded into Blanks. I can see here the output just like I normally would for any other Blanks image. So again, your experience as a cloud administrator with actually administering Windows images and instances doesn't change. It's just the developers, just whatever operating system they want to use, they can. If they want to use Windows, use Windows. If they want to use Linux, use Linux. It's just uh, for them, different points of administration. So if they want to get into a Windows instance, they use remote desktop protocol on 3389. If they're using a Linux instance, most likely they're using SSH on port 22. OK, let's see. Um, do I have any other slides? Oh, OK, while I'm waiting for those to build, just going to throw out a plug for my own blog, uh, blogs.vmware.com forward slash OpenStack. So I write about topics such as running Windows on OpenStack, for example, setting up your Windows desktop to be an OpenStack uh, client or run the OpenStack clients. Uh, so a lot of good information there. Uh, if you have any questions about OpenStack in general, I don't just write about VMware. I'm a VMware employee. It's a VMware blog. I also happen to be passionate about OpenStack. So I like sharing any kind of information that is interesting to me about OpenStack, even if it's not easier related. And then cloud-based IT. Cloud-based.it, that's the website where you can get uh, the binary for cloud-based to install it in your Windows image. Also, you can get a trial image of Windows 2012 R2. So let's say you don't want to do this manually, you have your own keys, but uh, you just want to get an image somewhere. They actually have a trial image that you can download, and I'm pretty sure you can apply a license to it. But either way, if you just want to test it really quickly, you can. They have a KVM compatible image, as well as a Hyper-V compatible image. And then last but not least, um, how many of you have heard of OpenStack Heat? Everybody's actually going up. All right, cool. So they're actual heat templates that show you examples about configuring Windows instances. And they actually run cloud-based scripts. So there's PowerShell examples that you can take and use in your own environment or give to developers so they can have access to it. So I highly recommend checking out these three resources, especially the one on the top, just because it's fine. <laughs> just kidding. But if you have any feedback, by all means, let me know what kind of topics you'd like to see on our blog. So let me go back to my demo environment. And let's see if my web server finished building. Nope, it's not done building yet, so I'll go and see what's going on with the line. Yep, CloudBase is still processing. That's why I don't have my administrator password set already. Oh, it seems to have just finished. Let me try the website again. I will let it fester for a little bit and see if it builds. Um, in the meantime, are there any questions on using Windows on OpenStack? Yes, Rick. Can you recommend any good OpenStack books? Any good OpenStack books? Well, there's the one by Cody Bunch that I highly recommend, um, the OpenStack Cloud Computing Cookbook. Um, I think he's on his third edition. 
And then um, there's a networking book written by James Stenson, also from uh, Rackspace, and he has written a good networking book. If you're interested in DevOps in general, I wrote a book called DevOps for VMware Administrators, and even though it says VMware Administrators in the title, the topics are actually applicable to any platform that you're working on. Is this specifically VMware administrators um, haven't been on the leading leading edge of DevOps yet, so I was trying to help the community along. But there's uh, information in there about Docker, Kubernetes, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, all the keywords, all the buzzword bingo terms for DevOps. So I highly recommend checking out those books, especially the OpenStack books, because that's how I got familiar with the platform with working with Cody Bunch, uh, doing some technical editing for his uh, second edition of the book. Pretty good. Now that he's in the third edition. Yes, question. So question about uh, when you take a snapshot. Yeah. This is when I install some more features. Snapshot is 50 times. So where that licensing feature is? Is it part of the licensing server? Can you take 50 instances of the image? If it's Linux, we know that it's open source. Well, technically, if you're using a vendor-supported uh, distribution of Linux, like Red Hat, um, you will be counted for each of those licenses. So it's the same behavior with Windows. Until they have an open source version of Windows, which I don't see them doing anytime soon, uh, if you're going to make 50 instances, even if it's on the same image, you're going to have to account for that uh, license for each one. I think if you have the data center version, you can have many copies of Windows on that one. Right, but um, that's true, that's definitely true. But you also have to be concerned about when you have to do like maintenance mode and stuff like that, and you have to move instances around, you just have to be careful with that. Even as a service provider, the one that I was working for, um, even if there was, even though there was data center edition of a no server, uh, we were still being held for our license accounts just because at any particular time, your instance could be anywhere in the environment, just because of maintenance, uh, just regular uh, resource balancing issues and things like that. Yes, question in the back. Um, do you have any experience with uh, running that from uh, to Windows? Uh, I have not run like Windows 7 or Windows 8 on other stack or anything like that, but the principles should still apply need to make sure you have the right driver version for the operating system that will be supported on your hypervisor uh, vendors list. Um, it's, it's really important just because I've heard horror stories of people having intermittent screens of death and they don't know where it's coming from. And most likely from what I've seen in my own testing, it's usually coming from the verb IO driver, either not being the right one or not having the right kernel in your Linux version uh, for that version of Windows you're trying to run. So it's very important to match that up with your operating system better, whether it's SUSE, uh, Canonical, or Red Hat. Any other questions? Actually, Trevor, yes. I have a slide. Can I say a few things? Sure. Lisa? Okay. You, you see people a chance to think about their questions. Right. Okay, topic. First, and also, Trevor did a fantastic oh. job. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, Trevor is way, way too humble because uh, despite <laughs> Rick's egregious <laughs> attempt for him to uh, plug his own book, right. Trevor's written a book on DevOps. And uh, why don't you give us two seconds on, on your book and then um, just do your book and do really good. So go right. ahead, don't be so shy. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so, the DevOps book uh, for VMware administrators, again. Let's forget about the VMware administrators part of it. It's for everybody. It's just, I was writing a book for VMware Press, and I need to have the VMware keyword in there. But going back to the book, it's actually a set of uh, cookbook recipes, just how do you work with DevOps in your environment. There's a lot of um, DevOps books that are out there that talk about high level, uh, how do you change people process technology, but not many that go into the nitty gritty details. So that's why I want to show people how do you begin with Puppet, how do you begin with Chef, Jenkins, Ansible, Docker, Kubernetes, and even some Git uh, stuff in there. So you run the gamut of all the popular DevOps tools that we might encounter. So check it out if you want to learn more. And they get it off Amazon? Amazon, Amazon, any retailer where the books are sold. 
Only with good bits of salt. Yeah. Most credit <laughs> with trashy bits of salt. Right. right. Uh, okay, so a couple of announcements. Um, thank you, Rick, for kicking everything off. And just, wow, what the heck are we Oh, I see. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'll change it. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not I'm totally fine. Uh, and, uh, okay, so the next meetup next week is at, it's on Tuesday, I think, on the 12th. Um, Google and Intel have been working very hard to get together and maybe collaborate on the slides and everything. Um, so that's going to be the Intel Museum. Uh, it's very MFB focused. But uh, we'll have definitely have a lot of side content as well, and Kubernetes and a lot of Google things at Intel. So that's <laughs> next Tuesday at the um, Intel Museum. We're working on another a couple of awesome years for you guys. Um, if you want to trek up to San Francisco, the next one I'm planning uh, is going to be on the 14th. Another talk, another awesome talk from the OpenStack Summit uh, that we're repurposing. Um, and Chris Marino and the crew are, are doing, and Robert Stitch, Star, Starmer, Starmer, are doing their talk on the new iPad features in Neutron and a new way to run Kubernetes on OpenStack. So, all over the network. So, that will be up in San Francisco. I think we're going to do it at the Geekdom. Um, I think the Geekdom is like a shared. A I think space. it's a rack space. Oh, it's a yeah. rack space. Yeah, no, you're right. It is rack space. Okay, so that's up on uh, yeah, 620 Wilson Street, um, San Francisco, and that one on 14. And we have a few other ones with that work, so keep checking the calendar, and um, we'll keep you updated. Um, thank you all of you who made it up to Palo Alto. Uh, I love this facility. Yeah, I'm sure the question for you. So oh, okay. Wait, it's supposed to be him. Oh, me. Yeah, yeah, so the meetup.com slash OpenStack calendar, where you found this one. How'd you find this one? Do you work there? Yeah, okay, so meetup.com slash OpenStack is our. We were the first one, so yay for us. Um, yeah, it's good to do first. So we started this meetup a few years ago, um, and a few of us have been to almost every one. We can download the app, we can just go www.meetup.com slash OpenStack. There's lots of ways to get to our calendar. So you can definitely see the Intel Google one posted. I haven't posted the Geekdom, um, the Geekdom one yet. I'm, I'm still looking at the details out with Chris, but I promised him I'd post that as soon as I get home tonight. So, um, and then just keep looking there for future things. Um, and again, thank you for coming here. I want to do more meetups here. I mean, Grant and Marius, you guys did a fantastic job. Yes, thank you. I literally grew up like four blocks. My mom was a professor at Stanford. Oh, okay. I literally grew up like four blocks down there. And yet, but this building wasn't here when I was growing up. Zero's Park was here, and that was about it. And that is a really cool place to have a meetup where it was. And the old man was still allowed to. Um, but thank you guys. Rick lives here. Maybe not in this building, but in that one. Which one is your building? Uh, all the way to this side. That's okay. So this is easy for Rick. So we want to do more of these here. So hopefully, now that everybody knows the way. Um, and we'll do a little bit better time. The one right after the summit is always a little bit tricky. Yeah. The presentation is always great because you guys like warm them up at the summit, and then um, but then people are sort of open stacked out. So yep. um, <laughs> <laughs> it's always a tough one. But thank you guys for making it here. Um, so now that I've thought of all your really really hard questions for Trevor, does uh, does anyone else have any more questions? For okay. Yes. Uh, you like the presentation? Yeah. Oh, my card, yeah. I'll have my business card available. I'm not a good businessman, that's why I don't have them immediately available, but I think they're somewhere in my bag. Otherwise, I can leave my email address with you. There was also a request for your slides. I got a couple of requests when I stood up back here. So sure. about the slides, right? So can you post the slides? Yeah, I'll post the slides. Okay. And, oh. <laughs> and we're getting paparazzi. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. I never show up on the site. I'm always the one taking a picture. Okay, so you'll post the slides where? You can post them to me. I'll put them on the meetup where I'll give them to you guys. Okay, you know yeah. where to put them. Rick has written us how to sort all that out. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Um, how popular is to use VMware in your headset or OpenStack? Um, well, personally, uh, as a vested interest in it being very popular, but um, we actually have many customers who are either in POC mode or actually in production. And uh, we're getting more of them to speak on behalf of OpenStack and things like that. So 
if you go to the Omen Sack social videos for where was it? Uh, Vancouver, as well as, well, from Vancouver on, we've had our customers actually speaking on behalf of there. So you can go on uh, YouTube, the videos are publicly available, publicly available, and you can see some of our customer use cases on there. And just to prove to you guys that Cloud Base is working, my IIS installed, I have my simple web page up and running. Welcome to the meeting. All right, any other questions? Anybody else? All right, well, don't be shy. We have a lot of food left in the back. So feel free to load up. Take some home to your families. It's fun for everyone. We don't want to save any of the characters in the good ones. So please, take as much food as you like. And enjoy it. Commiserate. Communicate. I know we're all geeks, but we can talk to each other. It's okay. All right, thank you.